Well, you're back in the pattern shop again. Um, been making patterns, you know, that's the, my thoughts are on it, that I like to do, use castings. You use plenty of fabricated locomotives out there made from solid, but I always like to make the castings. I'm always thinking, well, maybe I could possibly sell some parts. I'm always thinking of the marketing idea of it, but uh, you remember locomotives, the prototype locomotives were made from castings, so I like to use the castings whenever possible. And um, I've been making a journal box casting or pattern, uh, which is um, we had one before from Mercer. And it's a it's two and a half inches wide this way, and it's uh, two and three quarters wide length. And then the, this is roughed out for the bearing. I use a ball bearing. Um, a um, I think it's a thrust bearing. It's a, a, a one way thrust, and then it has a uh, seals on both sides and it's pressed in there. They're about, I've seen them anywhere from $22 on the internet uh, and the cheapest I found was seven or eight dollars and I'll probably get those. They work fine because they're not really used working to the capacity that they need, that they're designed to be worked with. Uh, this, the RPMs, probably thousands of RPMs, we're only turning them up in less than 100 RPMs, maybe 100 RPMs, I don't know. But um, uh, very slowly, but the idea is it carries the weight of the locomotive and, and the ball bearings on the, on the main drivers. You don't want those to fail. If, if a, uh, I like bronze bushings on everything. I use bronze bushings except the main drivers because you can't really get at them to fix them. So anyway, uh, I've been working on the pattern and remember what I said in some of my other videos, you make always make an extra in case something happens. So this is my extra journal box and this is the journal box cover that will get machined in after the bearings pressed in, it's covered over the, over the top in four bolts. And um, this is the match plate here. And, and these things you see are the risers, but on this side you see the patterns. Um, we have six, six impressions, they call them. Uh, the proper terminology is six, six impressions on a plate. This is the match plate. Now you say match plate. Well, match plate means that if you had a two-sided pattern, it'd be one on one side and one on the other side. And then when they put the holes in here for the flask, they match up as well. So when they mold this side and they mold the other side and they put them back together after they remove the plate, then they're going to match up. Okay, now what we got here is this is the main runner. And for, and for bronze, these are going to be made out of 85 three fives bronze. They call it 85 three fives. 85 five five five. What that means is 85 percent copper, five percent tin, five percent lead, and five percent probably cadmium or antimony or something like that. I can't remember. I'll find out. Because there's, there's a lot of shrinkage that it occurs when you use bronze. Um, and whereas iron doesn't have as much shrinkage, it more or less um, um, you use smaller gates and everything for that, so that, that, that's what I'm trying to make make a point. But uh, you have to use heavy gates for bronze or aluminum, not so much on aluminum as much as bronze. And what you need is you have to have to show the heavy gates, which here you can see them on the camera too over here. Uh, the heavy gates, and then on the opposite side, right on the opposite, the opposite side, you got the risers now. This is basically the way it's going to be in the, the metal is going to come in this end here and it's running, going to run down that riser and it's going to fill up right down that runner. It's going to fill up all the cavities and it's going to, the pressure of the mold, uh, the, of the metal going in, the, the weight of the metal is going to go up into these risers and then it's going to continue to push a lot of the things molten, it's going to push back into the cavities to keep them full. And then once it's full, it's going to come up the riser, and then and that's it. Where the pour gate is going to come up that, and then they know it's full. And right, now, when it, when it, when the thing starts to solidify, it starts to cool. The shrinkage is going to occur in these risers. It's going to keep feeding, feeding, feeding as the metal starts to cool. It's going to keep feeding, and it's going to shrink these. It's going to be a big hole in the center, is where where it kept feeding down into the part. Now. It's a lot of metal, but that's what you need to get good sound, they call it sound castings. 
And then when they're all done, they're going to take this out. It's going to look just like this, one big lump. And they're going to take it on a, on a big cutoff wheel, and they're going to cut it. they got this huge cutoff. It was a nasty job, dirty, nasty job. And they're going to cut these off. Then they grind them a little bit so they're flush. And then they uh, throw them in a, what's called a wheel abrader, and they, they tumble. And their shot comes from all kinds of directions. If you put somebody in there, a body in there, they would. What we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, I'm going to uh, wax this up. i got to put some wax fillets on it. And uh, uh, you have to have like big wax fillets so that they have the flow into the part, like big heavy wax fillets. And then smaller ones, of course, around. And you got to make sure that there's no gaps underneath. These are tight down. You, I use a clamp. And then I have two screws that you can see here where the, the filler is covering up the screws. And whoever invented those uh, drywall screws, they got to give them the Medal of Honor because they're the best thing. Back in the day when I first started making patterns in this, in the late 60s and 70s, those weren't around. And we used to have these regular wood screws. And boy, what a pain in the neck that was. They had to be taper holes and because you split the pattern. These things are so nice. You drill the hole, they got all the... Uh, Home Depot sells all of the, um, the counter sinks for it and you drill it and then you just go down and, and, and you just clamp it down tight and screw it into the plate and away you go. Get the proper light screw and everything's all screwed down. I used to nail this stuff all down. Now it's all screwed down. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the match plate now. Uh, this is uh, the board that I made up. It, it's it's um, about seven or nine ply, I think this is nine ply, birch plywood that they use for cabinets, a cabinet grade plywood that I get from the Home Depot. They sell it, believe it or not. Years ago, they didn't, you had to go to a, a real lumber yard to get it, but sometimes the Home Depot has stuff that's good, and that's one of them. And uh, you can buy it in two by four pieces, not cheap, but uh, um, a four by eight piece, you can get quite a bit of match plates out of it. However, the match plates are generally weird sizes. Like, for example, this is 14 inches wide by 30 inches long. And um, that creates a problem because it's an odd size and you wind up wasting a lot of material, but that's the size you need. And generally, the flash size on this casting, on, the, on this match plate, is going to be a 12 by 16. That's a standard size they have. Generally, they have 12 by 12, 12 by 16, 14, 16, 14, 18, and that's, you know, 14, 18, and 18, 18, sometimes, they're getting pretty big then, and then you're going to have two men hold open the mold. Now, you can say, well, how oh, would it be cheaper if I put 20 of these on a board? No, wouldn't, because now you got a mold that's huge, and guys need a crane to lift it, or... It, it is a time straight, a time um, issue. So one man can run this. In other words, he runs it, you know, he molds it up, flips it over, molds this side, and he can handle this. Now, for some reason, which I've never been able to explain, bron bronze and aluminum foundries use this type of end on the board, like what's like, uh, let me get this pattern here, this mat plate here that I'm working on. They use uh, th this type of a end on it, and there's a, there's a formula for that. It's like five, five this way, seven this way, and then uh, this down the center, and then you just cut it. And now, depending on this is always the same, and this way, and this way changes. So that's I used to have a little template for that. I put it on a board and trace it, and then cut them on a bandsaw. This is what they do for the bronze non ferrous foundries use this. I don't know why. It really doesn't matter, but that's what they use. Now, you've seen some of the other patterns I've made. They take the boards that are little shorter boards for iron, and they lop the corners off two inches, two by two, 45 degrees. They chop them off. And that is um, made for iron. I don't know why they have it that way, but that's the standard, at least around this area. Now, the one thing that I got to mention is you can use this for iron but they don't like it so you really can't use once you set it up for either bronze or aluminum or iron and that could be ductile iron nodular iron but mostly ductile iron these days not for steel steel is another story um, you, you um, 
you, once you set it up for one of those metals, either bronze or aluminum, non-ferrous or ferrous, you can't use them flip-flop in between the foundries because of the gating. Um, so you got to decide what kind of metal you want to use, and then you got to gate it accordingly. Now, you could just put the things on a match plate, bring them to the foundry if you're not sure about how to make the gating. Uh, take your patterns with you, maybe make your board up, and bring it there, and the guy will tell you how to put it on there, because they like to have about an inch of sand around the, around the patterns, and then roughly an inch or so, or plus, in between the patterns. And uh, you have to determine what size board you need for your pattern. Um, uh, the other thing is I use a, a pattern lacquer. It's lacquer paint. It's, pat, it's called 90-1 it's called Freeman pattern lacquer. And it's about probably $70 or $80 a gallon now. And a, 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 a gallon lasts you quite a long time. You really can't buy it in any smaller quantities. Do not, by no means, do not use any kind of house paint, not even oil-based paint. It's too thick, it's too soft. This is a hard paint, and it doesn't react with the, the binders and the chemicals that are in the sand to hold the sand together. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and wax these up. Get them all waxed in, scrape them with a little scraper to make sure the wax fillets are smooth, and uh, paint it up with some lacquer, and uh, it'll be almost ready to go. And then I have the, the, the covers to mount up, and I'll show you how we're going to mount those up a little bit later. But um, uh, it's fun making patterns. I enjoy it. Uh, uh, this is, uh, by the way, these are poplar. I have a big, huge, thick piece of poplar. It's two and a half inches thick by probably that wide, about this high, and um, I cut it up, and I have this heavy duty, my 10 inch Delta Unisol here, you cut right through it with three horsepower, and cut right through that hardwood, it's a poplar, it's a semi hard wood, and then I have over here, I have a planer, thickness planer, and you get it to the proper thickness, and talk about thickness, you really can't just make the thickness of whatever the wood is, and, and unless you design your pattern that way. But you got to remember, if you want something an inch and a half thick, it's got to wind up to be an inch and a half thick. It's got to be thicker uh, for allow for the shrinkage. Now, three sixteenths on bronze and bronze, five thirty second on aluminum, one eighth or a hundred thousandths per foot. Now these are all per foot on iron, ductile iron. Steel is a quarter inch equals a foot. But if you set the pattern up for iron, gray iron, um, and that's one eighth or eight, eight, uh, hundred thousandths per foot, which is, I use roughly one eighth or hundred thousandths per foot, so on 25 thousandths on a foot. Uh, you could still use that for ductile iron because the shrink is the same for ductile iron. But ductile iron is a, similar to steel. You could take a piece of square bar of ductile iron and bend it right in half. It's, it's like instead of the molecules being this way in iron where they would snap on, on, on tension, they're interlocked like finger jointed. So that's how you get that flexibility. And it's a much stronger casting. And there are some grades of ductile iron, 605506, for example, you can heat treat that. And I've made wheels out of that and heat treated them after they were machined and they're hardened, like like a, they got a surface tension of hardness to them and they'll work, wear very well on steel rail. Now, down the road, if some of these guys say, well, I don't like your cast iron wheels because we're running on steel. Anyway, we're going to go on now. And we're going to do uh, some waxing of the fillets and painting up the pattern and getting it ready to go to the foundry.